So with the particular use case that we've been presenting so far, we entered into using the BVBRC in the workshop in a way that's a little bit different than we typically do. We usually start by showing people how to use BVBRC with genome assembly and annotation, because historically that's where we've gotten the most users. The services that are offered by the BVBRC of those services, the oldest one that we have is RAST, which is the annotation system. And it's had hundreds of thousands of jobs over the years. And so it's been a pretty successful workhorse. And the annotation system per se is the way that all of the genomes essentially get databased in the, the BVBRC. And so the annotations of the proteins, which is a product of the, the protein sequence, is the way that we compare similar things. And you'll see that whenever we assemble and annotate genomes here. So my demonstration is specifically for the, the comprehensive genome analysis service. But what that is, is it's like a meta service that encompasses assembly and annotation. So there's several services that are relevant here. So if you go up under the, the tools and services tab, you'll see genome assembly, genome annotation. Those are the two subservices for comprehensive genome analysis. And there's, there are some slight differences. These were originally developed from the bacterial side. We weren't always BVBRC. This, these are originally Patrick services. And so there are some instances where they will work for viral use cases, if you have viral use cases, and some instances where they will not. So is anybody in the room working on SARS-CoV-2 still? Or did everybody give up on that? We done with SARS-CoV-2 yet? No? Yeah. <laughs> so we have a SARS-CoV-2 assembly service that's specifically for assembling SARS-CoV-2. And it's mostly up to date, but we need to add the new Arctic primers that came out a week or two ago. But that assembly service is specifically intended for SARS-CoV-2. That's a reference-based assembly. The genome assembly service up above is de novo genome assembly. And there's a big difference there because with the reference guided assembly for SARS-CoV-2, you're assembling against the Wuhan HU1 reference genome. You're tiling essentially. In de novo assembly, you're putting the pieces together on their own from scratch. And obviously that's the more appropriate one for bacterial assembly, unless you have like a really, really closely related reference genome. The genome annotation service, that forks into two different flavors of annotation. One is the original bacterial RAST pipeline, and the other one is Vigor4, which works for many different viral species. And Vigor4 is just a little bit different. It does sort of a blast base lookup of, of viral proteins because the viruses are for the families that it works on, they're pretty similar. So it, it's more blast-based, but we'll get into all of that. So if you click on the genome assembly service over here, you'll see an interface that's very similar to the ones that we've already looked at. You have the option to do a single end read library or paired end reads or a, a run accession. And that works for SRR or ERR numbers, depending whether you're coming out of ENA or SRA. And there are assembly strategies, which can be used out of the assembly service. So there's an auto assembly, which runs Unicycler and decides what the best strategy sh should probably be. I almost always use the auto recipe because Alan has put a lot of work into making sure that it works well. But if you had a metagenome and you wanted to assemble it, well, we've got metaspades. If you think you have a sample that has a lot of plasmids, we've got plasmid spades. That works pretty well. MDA for single cell, fly for nanopore. And there are advanced options that you can get into down below, depending on what you've selected. There's also polishing steps that happen. So there's read polishing. That's like a, as in my understanding, and, and this could be way off, that's like a normalization of the errors that exists in an equivalent column for a set of reads. Yeah, if you map the reads against the final assembly and you look at the the BAM file in the, uh, the 
the viewer and zoomed into the level where you can see the ACs, G's, and T's nucleotide content, you might see, you can see errors in the past Q files. And there's, you might find some columns where it's like a really consistent error, and all of the reads are saying it's a G, and for some reason the assembly says it's a T, and uh, the polishers will find just like that to say, oh, you get a correct assembly to a G because all of the reads are not wrong, so it, the assembly is wrong. Right, and you can tinker with that. With genome annotation, this is the genome annotation service. It looks pretty much the same, except the annotation service is designed to start from contigs rather than reads. So you have to have an assembled genome if you're to use the genome annotation service on its own. See, the comprehensive genome analysis service can take either. I'll show you that in a second. We have a bacterial, viral, and bacteriophage recipe for annotation. And this largely determines the sort of for lack of a word, database of curated proteins that these look up. There's a few other things like mature peptides and stuff like that that happen with viruses. You need to know your taxonomic name, the name of your organism as closely as possible. Sometimes you'll never know this because of, it's an experiment. And what you want to do is you want to pick the taxonomy that's close enough, as close as possible to what you think it ought to be. So if it's an Enterobacter ECE, you pick that. If it's Escherichia, you pick that. If it's E. coli, you pick that. And you try to get it as close as you can. And the reason for that is because we have some bespoke software that we'll talk about that runs at the species level. So you want to catch that if you can, but it will still work. And then obviously you can name it and you put it in an output folder. So I will show this really quick just so that you see it. SARS CoV 2 analysis service can start from the assembled contig or reads, and you basically can choose your primer version and stuff like that. Okay, so I'm going to CGA. And in the workshop, there's a follow along thing here under AMR workshop and comprehensive genome analysis. I'm gonna open up this Word document. The reason I opened this up is because there's an ERR number that she wants us to work with. Um, I guess I could have copied and pasted it from there, but okay. So I'm going back over to CGA. So the first run that we will launch out of here is for ERR 7916262. And this was that sample that Rebecca was working through earlier. Now, in order to launch that, what you have to do is you have to put your ERR number under the run accession, and then these little arrow buttons push it over into the right-hand window. That is so that you could potentially do multiple co-assembly, so that that's why that functionality exists that way. And then we will use the, the unicycler assembly strategy, which is fine. We could look this up. I think these are short reads and then it'll figure it out. And then this is Haemophilus influenzae. There we go. And I'm gonna call this from ERR, just so that I know which one this is. And I made a workshop folder the other day. So I'm just gonna put it, I'm gonna put it in there. You can create a new folder for this analysis or put it wherever you like on your home directory. And then I'm just gonna submit that job. Now, I'm not going to close this window because she wanted us to compare that with uh, a spades assembly. Unicycler is much better. Uh, always like, always. Okay. Wouldn't you agree, Alan? Yeah. Unicycler is awesome. Unicycler runs spades, but it runs it with multiple parameters to sort of summarize or fix the best one. But it also does some other useful stuff like tell you if the Contig looks like it's a circle. I think it could be circularized. And I believe it rotate and start at a at one of the standard start codons for a genome. So it's circular and that means You mean like an origin of replication? Yes. Always generally in my experience, yeah. it produces fewer contigs and spades, sometimes by hundreds. Well, this case, it's by hundreds. So I'm going to submit this as the spades job while we're talking. 
I didn't realize there was that make, big of a delta between the two. Let just sit back and take this workshop. And then you can learn. Well, I'm learning on the fly, man. <laughs> <laughs> how do you think I learned how to use this thing? I just get up here and I'm like, whoa, I don't know. And then you guys tell me and then it and then it all works out, right? <laughs> There's one more example she wants us to run. Back in yesteryear, earlier, before you guys fell asleep <laughs> and went to lunch and all the rest, there was a fast Q utils demonstration. And in that demonstration, Rebecca aligned this set of reads against human in order to separate the human reads from the bacterial reads. We want the ones that didn't align to human because those are the bacteria. And we want to assemble that to see if it does any better. So Conveniently, she's saved these in the workspace. So I'm going to go back. Oh, there it is. Okay. Here we go. So over here in BVBRC workshop, AMR workshop, comprehensive genome analysis, under human, we have unmapped one and unmapped two. So I'm going to click unmap one and click OK. So that's the first pair. And then the second one, I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to go to workshop, AMR workshop, comprehensive genome analysis, human, unmap two. Now, people always ask, does it matter whether pair one or pair two goes in either slot? And the answer is no. It's smart enough to know that they're pairs. It doesn't care, basically. Now, I push those over into the little right-hand side box, because remember, we could assemble four or eight or however many sets of pairs you want. I'm going to select unicycler, even though auto would give me that anyway. Uh, it's bacteria or archaea for the annotation recipe. We know that this is haemophilus. 727, I should have remembered. And I'm going to call this H flu non-human. And I'm going to put that in the same output directory that I've been using for UVA April 23. What if I have long reads? Could I do a hybrid assembly? Yes. Yeah. But I don't remember. Canoe or unicycler. So canoe and unicycler. Well, I, I was going to say unicycler. Is the canoe recipe smart enough to realize it's intermixed with short reads? Well, canoe will use them for polishing. The short reads. The short reads. Okay. So it's smart enough to say, hey, I've got a mixture of short and long reads. Yeah. And it, okay. Is auto smart enough to do a, a, a co-assembly? Yes. Okay. Uh, can anybody that is not a member of BBBRC tell me when, why you might want to use long and short reads at the same time? Why would you pay for both? Because it's expensive, right? Short, short, short. More coverage, better genome. Yeah. A lot of people do that. There's some really rotten genomes that people have that are hundreds or thousands of contents. And, the, and if it gets if it's really bad, Jen thinks not going to accept it. So you would not mix them as pairs. You would do paired end set one and paired end set two. You have a paired end set that uses the, the top, that top entry here. And then you likely have a single read library yeah. for that. Yeah, and you would just push the right arrow and then you'd end up with two over here. Yes. Now, another thing you can do is often your sequencing center will run multiple lanes because they're thinking some of these will fail. So typically they'll at least run two, but they might run as many as four. And if they were all good, you might have four pairs of short reads. However, if it gets too big, you run the risk of failure. Yeah. Like we've had people put in like 27 repaired reads there. You know, some of these are uh, gigabytes and there's just so much we can, we can do. But you'll get better coverage mm -hmm. and better depth. I've just got a user question saying, where do I find coverage and depth statistics and the number of ends. So although I haven't answered that person yet, Jim will answer that for you. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so after we launched our jobs, they show up over here on our jobs page. And if you look at the jobs page, it can sort your data by service. So if you only wanted to look at the comprehensive genome analysis jobs, you can select those. It shows you the ones that are running. We should talk a little bit about the queue. The queue is smart in that it understands sort of fair share distribution. And it also has a little bit of an understanding of how big jobs are. And so if you're like me and you push 10,000 or 20,000 into the system at a time, your priority goes down so that we can maintain sort of nice user-friendly system for everybody. But most low-level users won't see that. But if you're a power user, you will encounter that. And it says running, but running means that it, it has received the job. It may or may not have been pushed out to a, a node to complete the job at this point. What happens if I move the read pairs? Like I originally ran them, put them in one place, and then I'm cleaning up my workspace and I move them before the job is in, so really started being submitted. Oh, I've never done that. It probably yeah, break it. It breaks? It's going to fail. Wait <laughs> until it's running. Wait until it's done before you do cleanup, or it's going to fail, because the pipeline will go look for it in the place you designated. We get a lot of tickets about this. Why did my oh, really? fail? Uh -huh. And it's because people went in, and there's a queue. So even though it looks, you got to wait, just wait till it's done. But they'll say, oh, I'm cleaning up. I'm going to move this over here. And then when it, when the pipeline goes to look there, it's not there and it'll fail. And if you really hated what you did and you did a big screw up, you can kill a job. Yeah. You know, if it's an assembly job or a binning job, that's a good idea. If it's an annotation job, it'll probably just go really fast and then you can just delete the output. If you want to delete a genome, people will ask us, how do I delete this genome? Well, you can't right now of your own stuff. We have to hand it off to our database expert. If he has to manually go in every so. Now, if you have a job that failed, you can click on it and you can report that issue back to us. And it'll have the parameters of what we're run so that there's a trail of breadcrumbs that says what job it is. And it gives a bit of information on the workflow that was done so that we understand. It's much easier to report it this way. Okay, so yesterday or the day before, I actually ran these already. So I can walk us through what the answer is going to look like. We're not just standing here and pretending to wait. So from the jobs page, there's a little view icon in the green action bar. And you can click view from there. Or if you go to the workspace, to the directory that you did the run in, which this one for me, I can look in here and pick that particular job. This little checkered flag it represents a completed job. So here's the one for, we'll start with Unicycler, because that, that was the first one in the example. And I'm going to click on that. And this actually gives me a directory with two job directories under it, the assembly job, which obviously went first, and then the annotation job, which went second. Now, I want to show you the genome report. The most interesting thing in the top level directory for the comprehensive genome analysis is the genome report. The genome report, the design ethos was that it, you should be able to at least use this as a good starting point if you wanted to write a genome report. It shows you the total number of contigs, the GC content. Those both look pretty good. We got 32 contigs on the unicycler output. Various statistics like N50. The N50 is good. That's the size of the smallest contig if you sorted them in order of their length and you picked those that were greater than or equal to half. So that's the N50. So half are at least as big as 142 KB, and that's pretty good on a on a short read assembly for a genome. I mean, it it is hemophilus, but that's still pretty good. Number of chromosomes, that's going to come out as zero because they're contigs. Job ID, start and stop, and the total time. So this one took 28 minutes and 53 seconds to assemble on unicycler. 
So that's the sort of high level assembly statistics. Then we get down into genome annotation. We got 1700 CDSs. CDS stands for coding sequence. It found 52 tRNAs, four ribosomal RNAs. That seems pretty good. I don't remember how many it should have for tRNAs. We've got a job ID and, and stuff. And then now we're getting into the, the functions of the proteins. So this is sort of a high level overview of the protein functions that the annotation system found. So we have hypothetical proteins, proteins with functional assignments, proteins with EC numbers, that's the enzyme commission. Those are usually enzymes, but there are also sort of housekeeping genes in that mix. Go assignments with pathways, proteins with genus, and we call these local families, but these are genus specific or cross genus families, which are global families. So these are the protein families that are assigned by the system. The next thing it tries to do is that it tries to provide you with a graphical representation of your genome. If this had been one contig, it would probably be a really nice visual. And it's done using a tool called Circos. You can download it. It's in the project directory. And there's a legend here that shows you from inside to outside what everything is. These are sequences on one strand. These are sequences on another strand. One of these is GC skew. I think we got some AMR gene. Oh, ribosomal RNA genes, antimicrobial resistance, and so forth. The thing to remember about the Circos diagram is that this is a default view and it's trying to make a circle. And most for most bacteria, that's fine, but there are a handful of bacteria that have linear chromosomes. So you got to watch out for that. And then it's default ordering of the contigs is just by size, which is why you get this like really long contig. And then, and then towards the end, you get like these little blips. There is a, also a circular diagram tool that you can use to try to do a better job than this, but just keep that in mind that it's trying to give it to you the way it thinks it should, it should go. The next thing is the subsystem pie chart. Subsystems can be thought of, these are functions in the annotation system that are organized by cellular machinery. So there could be a subsystem for transcription, and that subsystem might contain RNA polymerase, the sigma factors, things like that, or one for translation, which would include the ribosomal proteins and things like that. And this hierarchy is sort of inherent to the annotation system. And so people find this pie chart rather useful because it shows you your metabolism genes, like what's, what's involved in what. It's like a very, very high level view of, of, of what it found. And typically when it comes to the annotation system, genes that have complete EC numbers, genes that are annotated in existing subsystems are, well, I should say proteins, are proteins that have been annotated by somebody and then projected onto your genome. And so those are usually the highest confidence calls. Then it gets into specialty genes. These are protein similarity-based matches to other people's well-recognized curated databases of special genes. So CARD is probably the most famous database of antibiotic resistance genes. We got drug targets. We match against the NCBIs, AMR genes, virulence factors, transporters, drug targets. There's also human homologs if we find them. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. What's the protein similarity threshold for a match on the specialty genes? I think 80% identity and over 80% coverage. So the query sequence coverage and uh, the, the subject sequence coverage needs to be 80% of the total length. And then it also requires 80% identity. 80-80, coverage 80. and identity. There's a specialty genes tab, which actually shows the percent identity. And we can show that in a little bit. So you, you get the information. So you'll be able to assess it for yourselves. There are two important considerations here. These are links on the database side, which we'll show you in a minute. But these protein-based matches, they're similarity-based. And so if you get an AMR match to gyrase, so there are point mutations in gyrase, which confer resistance to Cipro or other fluoroquinolones. This will pick up a match to gyrase because gyrase is a universal gene. 
that doesn't mean it's conferring AMR. We get that question a lot. It's a protein-based match. So CARD has gyrase? No. NCBI has gyrase? When we do the protein-based match, you will get it, and that, but that does not tell you that your genome is resistant. It tells you that your genome has gyrase. <laughs> so keep that in mind. A lot of people think that the matches are an imputation of resistance, and that's not true. Going back to the table, what's the difference for how you read that for antibiotic resistor using cars, you got, you got four genes, and using PAD, you want 23? They're primarily curated by different people. The Patrick database at the time had a much better curated list of tetracycline resistance and a few others. Some of these may be over projections. My recollection is that some of those are, are Kamer based over projections, but we'll take a look at them shortly. Okay. And in fact, here's what some of the gene names that are being called. And there, here's, you know, gyrase. It's not, that's probably not a resistance gene. And then finally, we have like a reference tree and your genome gets placed on a reference tree so that you can orient to yourself on, on what you have. This is not comprehensive. It doesn't pull. Five genes. Yeah. Please don't use it in a publication. Five genes is probably fine. It, what it doesn't have are all of the close relatives that could potentially exist. I always tell people don't use this one. Because if I'm reviewing the paper and I see this one, I say, no, I'm wondering where. If it has all the genes. genomes you care about, it's not, it's probably not also rooted correctly. You know, it, yeah. I mean, you, you're not rooted this on. just give you a sense of where you are in the great scheme of things. Oh, and scroll way down at the bottom. There are references to Those the tools all that were used. references that you can use in your publication that I see that Unicycler is missing. And I can get, get oh, well, for that. We'll have to get that in. That is to get in. Before you go to annotation, could you step up one, just one in the breadcrumb? No. Okay. Could you click on assembly, the, the checkered flag? Yeah. And could you click on the report? Yeah. Scroll down a bit. Yeah. Do you want me to just walk us through this? Sure. So this is called a bandage plot. It is a schematic of the different contigs and basically how they assembled or didn't assemble. So you can see where the knots are, where there were repeated regions where the assembler could not get through. And it was confused, basically. What would be a great way of getting reading through the repeat regions? Again? Doing a long read sequencing. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a piece of candy. Give you a chocolate. What's another <laughs> way to go through it? Mom, biologists, what do we do all the time to get through difficult situations? It's a machine on the bench. We design primers. We do PCR. We also have, and I don't know if there's a module on it, we have a whole genome aligner too that might help you survive this as well. If you had a complete circularized Haemophilus reference genome, you could probably do a whole genome alignment to it That's and figure out the order. Okay, here's our assembler. Here's more information on it. And you know, it's showing you the command line calls, an average depth of 346, that's good. You need that in your publication. Yeah. When you have the results section, the reviewer, if there's any reviewer that's any good, they're going to want coverage and they're going to want depth. And if you did long and short read, they're going to want those statistics for both of them. And you'll find both of that right there. You know, we have our thresholds here of what we set. Ends per 100 KB is zero. Ideally, we didn't have these statistics when we first designed the comprehensive genome report, but... I think it's due for an update and we should put those in there because those are the things they need for publishing. Yeah. Just more statistics down here. Here's the versions of the tools that were used. If you view a, a job from the jobs page, there's also information on what was used. Oh, there we go. So these are parameters that were used. That's sort of higher level parameters. And then if I go to assembly. Here's the log on the unicycler, which should tell you exactly what was done. 
So that's the standard output of the unicycle. For every service, you should be able to follow the trail of breadcrumbs back through to know exactly what was done at the command line. It should all be exposed. There is any feature in which you can compare in the same time two people, two different assembly tools, or you have to just get one out when the only one and you do it by yourself? You mean to look at the, the genomes themselves and compare them? Uh, to see, yeah, to see the uh, statistic metrics of the uh, genome assembly for both. Yeah, she's asking about a side-by-side -side comparison of two different assemblies, well, as I understand it. You mean the statistics on the assemblies or looking at like the proteins that are annotated, et cetera, et cetera. The mom. There's the cross report. Yeah, but she's to see. She wants two side by side, though. Let me take us back through here. Remember, we submitted a, a job of spades and a job of unicycler. And so we can take a peek at that unicycler job. <laughs> and we don't have to take too much time here. The takeaway point here is that on this particular assembly, the unicycler helped a lot because it, it was almost 500 contigs. Yeah, and the N50, that was worse. The genome length is off. So there, there's a, a bunch of different things here that, that don't look nearly as good. You can see it in this, the circos plot. It's just nasty looking. And then the bandage plot is probably, bandage plot might be fun to look at. One of the things I do when I run through these things, and because I always run, when I'm testing things, I run every different combination. And I it in an Excel file and I look at the context and I so I just take that cost report and I know this will bother a lot of these guys but I paste it into Excel so that I can see it diagrammatically the way I like the sample data myself and see it as in that kind of table to so have a direct comparison across and then I choose I make a choice of which one I wanted to proceed further with. I was just wondering if there was that way you can just see it side by side in that I specific application. Because that's the way I do that <laughs> is I take a screenshot of the table <laughs> for each of them, and then I pop up the two screenshots. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a, um, a way to push two in and yeah, have them come out. Yeah. That would be nice. So just before we leave this, there's the bandage plot, and a it's hard to small, see, but a lot of small. there's a lot of small stuff that unicycler must have figured out how to toss. And finally, before I totally walk away from this, since this was Rebecca's example, the unmapped human reads, we should look at those. 29 contigs. I don't really think this one was as good or better. I can't, well, we had 32 contigs on the other one. Yeah. So it's, they're pretty much equivalent. Most of that, the reason I really wanted you to do that is to, because sometimes you get significant contamination. This one had very little, but you can run and pull things out of it in the homework. In fast to utilities where you, was you were supposed to map it into the best matching homophilus influenza genome and look at the difference there. But sometimes, I mean, this had very little human contamination. Sometimes there's a lot. And so at some points you have to make decisions of what you have to do. If you have a good vertebrate reference genome, we have 10 that you can use here, only 10 though. But we do a lot of work with people who work with pigs and mosquitoes and stuff, and we don't have those genomes. So then you have to, and you'll see like a lot of the, uh, a lot of the bacteria and stuff or deep, you want to get rid of all those reads. So you're forced to map it to the closest bacterial reference to get rid of all. So it's only going to be reference genomes who are part of the database, which is in the server. Which is pig, drosophila, human, chicken, mouse, rat, xenoreptides, and there are three more. Zebrafish. There are 10, but I can't off the top of my head remember exactly. Could you go to another tab of it? Oh, yeah. Periodic genomes. Click on there. There they there are. They are. Oh, my God. Oh, and the uh, weasel, because uh, they 
use a lot of mycobacterium. They run them a lot through measles. Really? I thought that they used armadillos for mycobacterium. That's for leprae. Oh. Leprae. Okay, so ne the next part after our assembly was our annotation. And since we're kind of stopped dead, I'll, I'll take a moment to describe what happens in the annotation service so that you have a good idea about that. Uh, I would point out that Mastella putorius is the ferret. Um, ferret, the weasel. Uh, they're, the they're the same thing. <laughs> Honestly. So if you're thinking about an assembled genome, the next question you immediately want to ask is what's in there, right? What is it, what's encoded by this genome? And the annotation service attempts to provide answers on that. So when you submit that assembled genome, the first thing that it looks for, I'm doing this from memory, so I might make a couple of mistakes, but basically it looks for ribosomal RNA. Every genome, unless it's in the viral annotation pipeline, it's going to have you know a 16S, 23S, and a 5S. And it's going to look for those first. And it's not going to let anything map over those because you need those. Then it looks for the other, it looks for the tRNAs because you need those. And the next step is that it looks for repeat regions in your genome. It does that by blasting it against itself. The repeat regions are good to annotate because they commonly contain the ends of insertion sequences and, you know, that kind of low complexity DNA, the, the kind of stuff that usually breaks in assembly. And so it's useful to have that annotated as a feature. So you can say, oh, I'm, I'm on the edge of a repeat region. And now here's my insertion sequence and which is carrying my AMR gene and so forth. Actually, one step prior to that, it looks for special proteins, which are not to be confused by specialty genes. In our line of work, everything is special. There are two types of proteins that it looks for in a special way, and they are pyrolysine and selenocysteine containing proteins. Pyrolysine and selenocysteine are amino acids, but they're non-canonical amino acids. And they're encoded by a special mechanism that co-ops one of the stop codons. And so when you see an open reading frame in a genome and it has a stop codon in, in it, the gene callers want to turn that into two genes, but it's, it's not, it's one gene that has a selenocysteine encoded in it somewhere. And so the way those tools work is that they basically have a big collection of selenocysteine proteins and a big collection of pyrolysol proteins, and it blasts against the genome, the ones that are good hits. It just calls those selenocysteine and pyrolysine containing. And I think there's a bit of logic that looks for the stop code on that needs to be there. But so we call those and get those out of the way. Then the next thing that happens is that we use the gene calling algorithms in order to find open reading frames for protein encoding genes. We use both prodigal and glimmer to do this. And then the open reading frames are, are used for downstream analysis. So prodigal and glimmer, they're similar. They're both algorithmic gene callers. They look for start codons and they learn from the GC content of the genome and stuff. Glimmer has a tendency to make calls that are very short genes. And so we have a reconciliation step at the end that basically scores the call to tell whether or not we think it's real. So once we have those open reading frames, this is where the annotation system really comes into play. This is sort of the, the special sauce that makes RAS different than other annotation systems. We have a, uh, a library of eight mer amino acid camers. These are, they're short signature amino acid camers that exist only in genes of a certain function. So all of the RNA polymerase beta subunit proteins will look for all of the unique eight MERS that describe that set. And when we find those, we know that we're looking at an RNA polymerase beta subunit protein. And it's that mapping that attaches a curated annotation to each open reading frame. And those curated annotations come from people who in our team who annotate proteins all the time and put them into a database called the seed. And so we draw upon that mapping of eight mer amino acids sequences 
to the database to, to call the, the protein encoding genes for your open reading frames. And then after that, I'm trying to think of some of the other things that we do. There's a few species specific tools. And finally, oh, we look for the specialty proteins, which we just spent a lot of time talking about. So we match to ARDB, CARD, VFDB, NDARO, TTD, and all of those. And then we have a set of, actually a set of machine learning classifiers, which are due to be updated. But anyway, a set of machine learning classifiers that if you have the correct species, it'll try to predict whether that genome is susceptible or resistant to a set of antibiotics. And right now the current system works on, it'll do this for Acinetobacter, Salmonella Klebsiella, Streptococcus, Staph, maybe one or two others. But if, if you have those genomes, it will try to predict whether they're susceptible or resistant. And the features that it uses from the genome, which is like a nucleotide 15 mer, I think, are displayed as, as features in your genome that you can look at. Unfortunately, Haemophilus is not one of them, so I'd have to show you a different genome in order for you to see that. That's pretty much it. In order to look at your genome then, there's two different ways that you can look at a private annotated genome. The very last step of the annotation system is the indexing step. That's where we take your genome, your private genome, and we index it into the solar database where it can be compared to all of the other genomes in the database. And the basic unit of comparison is the annotation of the sequences. And so that's, that's kind of the unit of currency here. Your job may show up as completed before it actually gets indexed. Sometimes people get confused by that. It usually takes another 10 minutes or so for the genome to get indexed against solar. So you can't browse it right away. It's actually at the top of every hour. So, oh, I didn't know that. It used yeah, to be every so 10 minutes. You have a queuing system and all the genomes that are getting annotated, they'll all get, you know, uh, they'll be waiting in the queue. And at the top of every hour, all of those genomes get indexed in the database. So after that, you can start browsing them. Uh -huh. So your job may, be, uh, may look as completed over here. You can browse the file, but you can't search for the genome or visualize it until the genome is indexed. Okay, so the first way you can look at it is if you go to the jobs page, if you click on jobs down here in the bottom right, and then you click on the job that you care about. So I'm going to do unmapped human, I call that unmapped human test, and I can click view here, the eyeball icon in the green power bar, action bar. And then up here, there's an eyeball icon for view. And that takes me to the landing page of that particular genome. So if, if your genome has been indexed, this will load. If your genome hasn't been indexed yet, it'll either be blank or it'll throw a warning at you. The other way you can look up your genome, there's, I mean, you could try searching for it, but I will, I'll do it this way. Is Haemophilus one of our target organisms? It is not, unfortunately. Okay. So I will do this. Well, I guess I could do that. So if you search for Haemophilus influenzae, you can go to the genome list. And I don't like to do it this way because there's 928 of them. And it takes a little while to load this table. But you can filter the table. And over here where it says public, you want that to be false. So it's like a, it's not public, it is private. But it, that means the public is false. You should only have a few if they've been indexed. But here are my, the ones that I've done recently. So I can click on the genome from here, go to the action bar, click on genome. And then that brings me back to the landing page for that genome. So the two ways you can get in is through the jobs page or by searching for the genome, by finding the genome through the search. A lot of what's on the landing page for that genome looks really similar to that genome report. So you have the ID, the name of the genome, you know, what's encoded here, except now that because this is indexed, we have live links for things. So I can click on this ribosomal RNA link and that'll load the ribosomal RNAs that it found. So here's our 23S, we got two 5Ss and a 16S. Assuming that the 5Ss are full length, that's good. And you can click on those and turn them into a group or align them or do whatever it is that, that you wish to do. So as you scroll down through this genome overview page, 
you get a pretty good look at various information that we have that was bundled up in the, the comprehensive genome analysis results. The nice thing about these is if you wanted the genes with the EC numbers or the genes that were virulence factors, you could click on those links and evaluate them. And so to get back to that original question about AMR, here is the Patrick list of AMR genes. So you can see here that some of these, they look like they're legit, but then, you know, you've got to look at, well, HNS, I would, I would quibble with. Some of these, though, with gyrase, for instance, you, you have to actually look at the nucleotide sequence to know whether that, you know, confers resistance. Back with CARD, what are the four that CARD gives us? Looks like we have gyrase, a multi-drug transporter, EFTU, and TOPO4. Again, I wouldn't trust that without looking at the uh, exact nucleotide sequence. And these are based off of a BLAT match. So this is 90% protein similarity, and here's the E value of that. And uh, I'm trying to see subject coverage. You can, so you can actually add columns to this by clicking on this little plus sign over here. Um, you can see the coverage now of the subject. Questions with that? Those are nice strong hits. Yeah, yeah they're nice strong hits, but I'm, they're not an imputation of resistance. So this is what I'm telling me is the number of genes that I'm, so you have my genome. Um, what is this playing there is the uh, basic sequence similarities. What is the uh, potential stunting of progress yeah. genes that I might have yeah. in my genome? So this is more like a prediction because how you mentioned before. Right, it's just a match to genes that have been shown to be resistant. Okay, so if people. you want to actually know what is going on, I can do a little bit more digging on those genes. That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. So the way to interpret everything that is under specialty genes is basically what it's telling you is that here are the genes in your genome that are highly similar to other curated genes in like, you know, this manually curated virulence factor, AMR gene, or drug target data. Right. And I think that's where the assertion stops. And then you'll have to kind of like you know, deeper to actually know what are the specific names or barriers that are responsible for, let's say, antimicrobial resistance, or if it's a virulence factor, then, like, you know, how does it compare to other homologs? And whether there are any mutations that kind of like may be causing a different function of that gene compared to the other. So there is kind of like a you know, gap there that you'll have to try to keep like, in. And another thing, not to totally bombard you with information, but the annotation system works in protein space, but a lot of these AMR genes are SNP specific. And so our nomenclature for certain AMR genes is a little bit different because it has to project in protein space and not create a whole bunch of problems, not be inaccurate or over project or under project. And so what that means is that in the beta lactamases and in the amino glycoside resistance protein specifically, you get an annotation that describes an entire cluster of nucleotide based resistance. So just be aware, you'll see amino glycoside resistance type three, four, five, six, seven, or something like that. And it, the whole thing gets dumped on that protein because those clusters were based off of a phylogenetic tree of that gene and one protein sequence covered all of that space. So just be aware of that. Okay, so I'm not gonna click on the phylogeny tab, but that's another contextual tree. So that's like a tree of the things that are close to it. The genome browser, I end up using this tool a lot, actually. This shows you all of the features that were called on each contig. And so up here, there's a dropdown of contigs that you can select and then as you mouse over them it tells you you know what each gene encodes and this i just happened to hit an allyl tRNA synthetase so you can zoom it in and you can take it the whole way to the nucleotide level so you can see you know at the beginning and you can drag and move around on it so if we're persistent here we can see if which frame so the bottom line is which amino acid it is of each frame. And you can see if your gene starts with an AUG, but I'm kind of losing patience with that. So 
So you, you can look at that in, in great detail. Now in the public collection of genomes, it'll actually show you our gene calls with our annotations versus if the genome came from GenBank, what GenBank had originally assigned in that same place. And sometimes there's important differences, like sometimes they're ahead of us annotation-wise, sometimes we're ahead of them. And so you can kind of aggregate information by looking at the public genomes in that way, but you obviously won't get that for your personal genome because it's fresh to the database. Circular Viewer is the same as it was before, except now it's interactive. So you can add or remove tracks. These were the same original set of tracks. You can delete or you can add a custom track and somewhere on here, there's instructions for how to do that. So you have to have the contig ID start and stop and a value if you're coloring based off of a value. So you can actually build up tracks against what you care about. And you can actually add things in that way, which is... Step through that on the SNP pipeline. The yeah. Service. People like that. And now we're getting into the uh, the deep, deep jargon of our resource, and we hit the sequences tab. Sequences are contigs. They got called sequences. I don't know. They're contigs. Anyway, so you can select each contig and work with it downstream if you want to do something like that. You can select it. You can add it to a group, but you can blast against it. You can, you can download the fast day. You can look at that particular one on the browser. The feature list, this is everything that was called by the annotation system. And so you can filter the list and look for CDS, RNA, tRNA. If it was a different genome that was called by a classifier, you could get an AMR classifier region. If there were repeat regions, you could see those. So depending on what species it is and what annotation tools end up being applied to it, you can sort the features in that way. But if you were only interested in ribosomal RNAs, it gives you a fast sort. And again, you can add tracks. So depending on if, if this was a public genome and you wanted to look at the locus tag, for instance, or if you wanted to look at whether it had a go term assigned to it, you can add those, those tracks. The proteins tab gives you the list of CDSs. And we didn't used to have this, but we kind of got into a philosophical discussion with the viral group because in viruses, you have proteins and then you have mature peptides. And anyway, it's a list of proteins. So, and that's free of charge. We have a protein structure tab. Now this, there's a specific set of genomes and proteins that you'll get protein structure data out of. You're not going to get it out of one of your own personal genomes, but if you search through the public collection, you will get those. And at some point, someone will walk us through that. So, so as we are integrating this predicted protein structures from AlphaFold for about 300 million proteins, we are also thinking of providing a service at some point where you can have a handful of selected proteins and you can actually predict structure of those or map them to PDP and do comparative uh, kind of vector proteins. You can take a multiple sequence alignment and then map it to a protein structure. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a button that says request alpha fold structure so that and then just start collecting them by request. Okay. But that's that's actually this the protein structures tab has been an area where our program manager has been very interested in growing us. So that's that's cool. Specialty genes, these were matching card, but I think that that's because I have the filters turned on and you can filter for various different sources and stuff of which specialty genes you want. And we talked about that at length. Domains and motifs, I don't think we're going to have anything here. Uh, that's the same as, so that's we, similar we to we protein structures. For the reference and representative genome. Yeah. Those are uh, costly calculation in turning into post scan on a single protein or single genome sometimes takes hours or days. So uh, you're making it available only for uh, select genomes. Now, protein families is very interesting. I think that you're going to get a demo of that from Rebecca working with the protein families. But if you wanted to go through protein families, you can select a protein family. So for instance, EFTU, you can then work from that protein family to do a variety of things, which are really super useful. Pathways, this tool, once it loads, will show you the various metabolic pathways, you can actually look at the metabolic pathway chart and see where your organism has metabolism. So I'm clicking on glycolysis. 
And then I can actually look at the, the pathway map of that. And then these highlighted ones are ones where our, your genome has that gene and the blank ones are the ones where it doesn't. And you can do a bunch of things that are cool there, but I think I'm, that's a spoiler for, for what's to come. Subsystems we've talked about. Well, we're going to do comparative each of these. Oh, okay, good. Just a second, let that in the dot, circular diagram loads. That's one of the most common ones. I look at every paper that cites us. I know which figures they use. And that's a very common figure. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it, but I don't know if we're going to get it to learn. it's slow today. Okay. Made some efforts. We're going to step. You're going to step through this again, right? Yeah, okay. So we'll, we'll, you'll see that again. We have a tool where you can compare groups of genomes at the per family pathways and subsystems called comparative systems that we'll do tomorrow. And then experiments, I think, are for, for reference genomes as yeah. well. So is there anything I've forgotten to show? I have a question. If I have annotated my genome in Patrick, can I just submit that to GenBank? No. Yeah. Why? No, GenBank, our annotations, well, you're picking an old scab. <laughs> Boys. Well, we're not that bad anymore. We're, we're becoming friends. Um, <laughs> but our annotation system and our structured language of the annotations are, are incompatible with GenBank. And so even if you prefer our annotations and want to work with them, when you go to submit to GenBank, you're better off to just submit through their ProCA pipeline. So what do I do? You submit the contigs and then you have to send them an email because it'll probably get rejected. No, no, she doesn't. I just did this recently. Okay, so it's it's easier these yeah. days. They swallowed it very easily. Well, that's just nice. Sent me my, um, they, they they're getting they're getting better. They're getting better. Well, the, oh, well, if you send them an annotated genome, yes, but if you bow to them and say fine. Annotate my contigs. Use Proca. I don't care. Then they will do it. And what's more is we go there every couple of days. So if you submit it there, you will see it here. It'll be re-annotated with BBBRC, but it'll also have the GenBank annotation. So you can do a direct one to one. But if you give them any annotations, I don't care who it comes from. They are going to fight to the con. They'll give you this. No, it's it's here. not. It's just not possible. You shouldn't even recommend somebody to do it. This is what I'm telling people to do. Tell them you did everything in BBBRC in the publication and that you annotated it with RAS TK, which you did, but also Proca because they want that. They'll have the accession there. It's going to show up in our website anyhow. That's right. And then you'll have to the, the, make the comparison. So that's just easiest. Just submit the contigs and then forget about it. Generally, we have big chips on our shoulders because they won't take our annotations. But finally, I've just been like, I just need an accession. I don't care. Yeah. And that's the way most papers are. Yeah. And I should say that if you submit a genome to GenBank, we'll get it eventually anyway, because we pull in on a nightly basis, the new GenBank genomes. <laughs>